Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Dennis Kelleher, President and CEO of Better Markets, which promotes the public interest in reforming the financial, capital, and commodity markets. Dennis Kelleher came to Better Markets after career as senior leadership staff in the U.S. Senate and as partner with an international law firm specializing in securities and financial markets. He has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. And I'd like to thank you, Dennis, for joining us today. Nice to be with you, Mark. So do we need better markets? Well, I think we desperately need better markets. And if anybody had a doubt about that, um, that doubt is gone after the financial crisis collapse and the economic calamity that it has caused the country so recently. The uh, financial collapse of 2008-2009 was the worst this country has suffered since the Great Crash of 1929. And the horrible economy that we've been suffering through since then is the worst economy since the Great Depression of the 1930s. And that's largely because of unregulated and non-regulated financial markets that enabled Wall Street and what are called too big to fail banks, firms, and activities to engage in reckless activities that were extremely lucrative for them, but extremely bad for everyone else. They got the upside, they got the bonuses, uh, they got the big houses, the big cars, and all that. And the American people, and actually people throughout the globe, got the bill. Uh, one of the reasons that we have, even today, a little over four years after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, uh, one of the reasons the economy is in such tough shape with its continued high unemployment, continued foreclosures, and very low to no growth is because of that financial collapse and it's ultimately because of a lack of better markets. And it's self-inflicted. It, it seems to be a dynamic that spins up at, at a time when we have an imbalance in terms of ambition on the one hand and this is a, an economy of ambition and we incent ambition. But there seems to be another element, which is to shape ambition in a way that does no harm. Exactly right, which is to say the country's foundation is built on uh, ambition, which causes creativity and innovation. So a big part of that ambition is based on the hope for riches, right. um, which is fine. That's what the capital system is all about. However, we know, and history has taught us, that capitalism and that ambition works best for everybody, including Wall Street, when there are clear rules of the road, when there are transparency, accountability, oversight, and that the rule of law that applies on Main Street applies on Wall Street also. It's as if the uh, NFL decided to go from 12 teams to 20 teams, yet didn't increase the number of refs. No one would watch football if they were running around like crazy and nobody enforced the rules. It wouldn't be fair right. and it wouldn't be interesting. And while it may advantage some, it would disadvantage most. And we actually saw a little bit of that when we had the uh, referees on strike recently. And everybody was all unhappy with the product. Now, it's very easy to see when it's the NFL. It's much more difficult to see when you take the refs off of Wall Street. And Wall Street, historically, is a high crime area. There's just no question about it. When you add up all the legal violations and misconduct that Wall Street engages in, there's really no competition for who commits the most crime. And it's Wall Street. And that's why they need to be regulated. They also need to be regulated for another reason, which is while they suffer some of the consequences of their misconduct, they don't actually suffer most of the consequences of their misconduct, which gets put on to society and American taxpayers. It seems that there, there has been a equivalency between uh, financial transactions that add and financial transactions that extract. And that this is extractive approach, as long as the, the result is, is that I get mine, there's almost a neglect of whether there's any value that's added to you. Now that's not the American approach to capitalism. It is one of the things that distinguishes our approach and that we care about the symmetricality of it. Well, and that's right. And, and the problem really is that this hyper short-term focus on the participants, too many participants in the financial industry, which is to grab as much cash as humanly possible 
as fast as humanly possible and no one cares about the consequences. And the entire incentive structure for Wall Street has been turned upside down so that it rewards that thinking. So that you have bonus pool focus every day, every week, every quarter. Because what you want is to maximize your bonus take. In the past, Wall Street has served and has served our country well. It's corporate finance, after all, is what our capital markets are. Yes. And they're incredibly important to our entire country, our well-being, and our standing in the world. Without our economy working, without growth, without employment, we are in bad shape from coast to coast. And that's why we can't leave Wall Street and our capital markets to themselves. The corporate profits of the financial industry be actually rose higher than 40% of total corporate profits in the United States. Well, those are people, I don't care what they say, they're moving paper around. They may create some jobs, but they're not creating enough. What we need to do is to get back to the, the, the era of, frankly, American supremacy, economically speaking, from roughly the 50s through the 80s, when Wall Street actually funded companies, looked for growth companies, and growth companies and people with good ideas and ambition who really want to make something, something people want, get funded, hire people, grow, and that's how the country grows. So they made money out of investing in, in companies and helping them to be successful as opposed to investing in the transactions um, and then moving out of those transactions as soon as you got your chunk of cash. And that's, unfortunately, that's only part of it. They're also making a big, big piles of money by betting against their so-called clients and customers. If you think about it, what Wall Street did, and I use Wall Street as shorthand, it's not just a geographic place. It really stands for too big to fail businesses and enterprises that operate essentially above the law. And what they did is they created hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars of what is euphemistically called toxic securities. Well, toxic is a synonym for worthless. Think about it, right? These enterprises created trillions of dollars of worthless securities right. that they created, packaged, sold, and distributed throughout the entire global financial system. And then when, because you can only do that for so long, but when people started looking at those securities and realized they were worthless, the entire house of cards collapsed as it did in the fall of 08. Well, I think it's also interesting that a lot of the, the money that was transferred, they were, it was transferred from pension funds, from um, uh, group investors of, of various sorts. And there's also a move to uh, reduce the power of unions, reduce the power of these um, small pl actors who come together in order to consolidate their power in some way so that it's meaningful. And there is some very systematic counter movements against that to prevent that from, from happening. Well, you're exactly right. And, and one of the reasons that Wall Street actually got so powerful, and one of the reasons that they were allowed to transform their economic power into political power is because there was essentially no countervailing power in the United States. In the 50s, 60s, and 70s, it was the unions that were the countervailing power that actually kept a check on corporate America and Wall Street. And for a long and period... And social justice movements. And, and social so justice movement. And for a long, point, a long period of time, there were public-spirited statesmen and stateswomen who occupied policy positions and political positions. And yet what happened is, as we saw that crest in about 1980, mm -hmm. and we saw um, the ideology of the market knows best, and he who has the most money is the smartest, take over, then you started having this proliferation of what's called the revolving door, where policymakers and politicians, what they call monetize their public service. What, it's kind of hard to call it public service and what you're doing is really right. cashing it in and putting it in the service of the highest bidder which continues to this day at a shocking rate with a shocking level of legitimacy and acceptance at all parts of our culture when it should be looked on at best as maybe at times a necessary evil. It's actually um, applauded and encouraged mm -hmm. by, frankly, 
all the way up to the President of the United States, who encourages and applauds his senior um, staff who go off to put their public service in the service of the highest bidders on Wall Street. And when you get all of that put together over time, deregulation happens, lack of legal compliance happens, and, it's, and when, when crime is unpunished, it's not just undeterred, it's incentivized, it's rewarded. And when that happens over and over again, it isn't just that the, what used to be the countervailing power centers that you talked about get eroded over time. But the legitimacy of our legal system, our justice system, and ultimately the foundation of our government and our culture, that people are equal before the law, and that there's one law that's applied to everybody, when people don't believe that, that's a serious, serious crisis in a country. So if, if, the, if the approach is to not have that result, and you start working, working back, to how do you not have that result, mm -hmm. and you conclude that some uh, regulation is, is needed. How do you finesse the issue of having uh, regulation, which can be a blunt instrument, um, affect both the good and bad actors? Um, well, first of all, regulation almost always helps good actors or those who want to be good actors, because what they do is they cabin in the excesses of the bad actors. And one of the problems with bad actors, and it's, it's an old saw, but it's true, one bad apple will ruin the bunch. You end up with a race to the bottom instead of a race to the top. And so good regulation, and frankly often any regulation, almost always helps those businesses who either are good or want to be good. Now, there's a number of canards out there about um, regulation, and the one that I love is the industry's always saying, you've got to be careful because too much regulation will stifle growth and hurt employment and it will be bad for Main Street. There is no amount of regulation, I submit, that man could think of that could do anywhere near the damage that Wall Street unregulated just did to this country. Anybody who's independent admits that we came within a hair's breadth of a Great Depression last time, and we just barely avoided it. And it's interesting, even to this day, we're not really sure which measure or which mix of measures prevented the second Great Depression. Right. But even though it didn't happen, the cost of the last crisis is going to be in the tens of trillions of dollars. And that doesn't even include the human suffering and the human waste and the ongoing economic wreckage from coast to coast of families at their dinner table where dad or mom for months, if not years, can't find a job. And it's not because they don't want to work. They want to work desperately. We now have econom an economy that doesn't produce enough jobs. When you add the financial cost and the human wreckage, um, it's, it's almost inconceivable. So to say that we're worried about regulation hurting growth or hurting employment by re-regulating Wall Street. It's a complete baseless canard. And if I could say, the history proves it. So we know for a fact that after the great crash of 29 and the Great Depression, the financial industry in the United States and the globe was regulated more heavily than any time in history. And we also know that during that exact same period of time, we had unprecedented prosperity in the United States. We built the largest, most broad-based middle class in the history of the world. And not only did American business thrive, but Wall Street itself prospered. You're making the distinction between regulation for the sake of regulation and regulation that prevents table tilting. Yes, and what prevents table tilting is transparency, accountability, and oversight, and a lack of concentration, which is to say the antitrust side of things, right. not to get too technical. But I don't want to be in the position of being seen to be defending all regulation and thinking it's all smart and brilliant. It is not. It is definitely not. There's smart regulation and there's dumb regulation. There is, and some regulation just can't be very well tailored. You're going to have over-inclusive regulations and you're going to have under-inclusive regulation. But the worst thing to do is to think that Wall Street knows best, that they're best when they're least regulated, and that hopefully things will work out right because the markets know so best. You're so really argue, you're really arguing against this idea that, there's, that to every complex solution there's a simple answer. There is no and simple it's, answer. It's the right. simple answer is no regulation, or the simple answer is 
we regulate everything. Right. It's not like that it's at all. It's not like that at all. We spend a great deal of time, and you were just talking about, a part of it is consciousness raising um, I would, and changing behavior, but it, it has to happen within some broad guidelines and rules within which to operate. You know, you, we can't afford to take the risk out of our financial system. We can't take risk out of capitalism. Right. It won't work. It won't serve our economy, and it won't serve our country. It must, right. It, we we right. have to embrace and fund our risk takers. That's why we have Apple. You know, Apple didn't come out of some other country. Apple came out of the United States. And, we could, and they're the best example, but there's, the country has examples from coast to coast of people, many people of almost no means at all, who had a good idea and were able to commercialize that idea. And we now have companies that employ a lot of people and have growth. We need that, no question. And you world. fail so that you learn to succeed. And you fail so you learn to succeed. That's right. And what I want and what better markets want is that the same rules that apply to Main Street apply to Wall Street. That's why one of the things Better Markets fights for the most is transparency in our financial markets. Because Justice Brandeis said it best 100 years ago that there's no better disinfectant than sunlight. And I'll tell you, sunlight on Wall Street and its practices will cause a revolution in this country. And you won't need a whole lot of rules. If you were to select three things that you would like to see happen in the next um, administration, uh, over the next four years, what would those three, three things be? Results, outcomes. Well, the first and most important would be to put in place the lead, strong, public-minded leadership of the regulatory agencies who would apply the rule of law to Wall Street like everywhere else. I'm not talking about disproportionately to Wall Street. I'm talking about like Main Street, Wall Street, accountability, because without accountability and the enforcement of the law, we will never get out of this vicious circle. It will not happen. Number two, which is a little bit outside the narrow realm that we work in, is we need campaign finance reform, because one of the big problems we have is that with Wall Street accumulating such massive Gilded Age wealth, they have transformed that wealth into political power which has enabled them to get more economic power. And lastly, what has to happen is the Dodd-Frank financial reform and Wall Street re-regulation law has to get put into place by the regulatory agencies. And that means three things. That means the president has to publicly come out and relentlessly support that from happening. That means Congress has to stop attacking and defunding the regulatory agencies, which is being done by Wall Street's purchased allies and ideological allies in public office. And the third thing that has to happen is people have to get in the game. I mean, Better Markets is trying to do everything it can to bring some balance both in the regulatory debate and in the public debate. But more needs to be done by the American people. Their net worth their retirement funds, their savings for college. That's what's at stake. Things have turned upside down where everybody's hyper-focused on Wall Street. We should not be really worrying about the condition of Wall Street. We should worry about the condition of Main Street. And if Main Street grows and thrives, then, Wall Street right. will grow and thrive. Our economy will grow and thrive. Our standard of living will increase. The lead is Main Street. The lead has to be Main Street. To say that you actually want to regulate Wall Street is not actually an anti-business point of view. It's the most pro-business point of view, the most pro-growth point of view anyone can have. Well, Dennis Keller, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on better markets. And thank you for your insights. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Enjoy the discussion. It's been great.